On this Monday night, Alberta's political scene gets a jolt. Former Calgary Mayor Nahed Nenshi is running to be NDP leader with his sights set on the Premier. Together, we can beat Danielle Smith in the UCP. His challenges ahead. Starvation marks the start of the holy month of Ramadan in Gaza, why a ceasefire is still off the table. The cold, hard facts about a dangerous time of year in Canada. You can see my heart rate has shot up and my skin temperature is dropping. What you should do if you fall through the ice and the mistake many people make. And far from picture perfect. It looks like they've been using software to do that. The edited family photo, who's responsible and how it's adding to conspiracy theories. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. A big political development in Alberta. The former mayor of Calgary, who never joined a political party when he was in civic politics, says it is time to choose a team. Nahed Nenshi is seeking the leadership of the Alberta NDP, hoping to replace Rachel Notley, who announced in January that she's stepping down. But his real target is Premier Danielle Smith, whose United Conservative Party Nenshi has called incompetent and dangerous. Heather Urex West has our top story tonight. I'm Nahid Nenshi, and I'm running to be leader of the Alberta NDP and your next premier. Calgary's former mayor is returning to politics, swapping his trademark purple, a mix of liberal red and conservative blue, for the NDP orange. I've never seen anything like this. A government this incompetent, a government this dangerous, this immoral. And I realized that I gotta get engaged in whatever way I can. As a three-term mayor, Nenshi has a history in politics, but he has a history with Alberta Premier Danielle Smith too. The two go back to their time as students at the University of Calgary in the early 90s. Last month at a rally protesting the United Conservative Party's proposed parental rights policy, Nenshi began fueling speculation of a leadership bid when he went on the attack. And I remember saying to them, Danielle Smith is many, many things. She is not a hater. I hate that I was wrong. I think that's a major driving force behind uh, why Nenshi is entering the race. I don't think it's ideological. I don't think it's as political. I think it's really personal. It definitely amplifies the sense of drama involved. And I think some folks in the Premier's office are kind of salivating out the opportunity to have those battles. And that's the, really the message. Nenshi will of course need to win the leadership race first. And that may not be an easy task. His path to victory is to sell memberships to people who are not already in the party. Because Nenshi himself is not a member of the, the party. Please go to nenshi.ca to buy your Alberta NDP membership. Nenshi's late entry means he has no time to waste. Supporters must be registered with the NDP by April 22nd to vote in the leadership contest. A race both the NDP and UCP supporters will be watching closely. I think the UCP sees some opportunity. Uh, but uh, they'll, they'll be facing um, a, a serious threat in Nenshi if he is successful. And Heather is with me from Calgary. Heather, how likely is Nenshi to win the NDP leadership? Yeah, while some see him as a front runner, this will not be a slam dunk. He is an outsider to the party, facing off with some strong candidates, four of them women currently serving in the Alberta NDP caucus. Now, to be successful, Nenshi will need to do what Danielle Smith did on the right, which is appeal to the party base, in his case, those die-hard traditional NDP supporters on the left, while also reaching out to the centre where the NDP's shot at forming another government ultimately lies. Donna? Okay, Heather Yorick's West in Calgary. Thanks. Heavily armed gangs in Haiti are tightening their grip on that country, even taking control of the airport. An emergency summit meeting of leaders from neighboring Caribbean nations took place today to try to solve the spiraling crisis. Canada's ambassador to the UN and the American Secretary of State both took part. While they talk, more Haitians are dying or being forced to flee their homes, and close to 3,000 Canadians are stranded. Mackenzie Gray is following the story for us tonight. <laughs> Chaos and crime overrunning the Haitian capital of Port-au-Prince, where the UN now says 15,000 people have been displaced over just the past week. Gangs calling for the ouster of Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry in control of nearly the whole city, leading to an emergency meeting of Caribbean and North American leaders. 
strong and decisive action owned by the people of Haiti must be taken to stem the sea of lawlessness and hopelessness before it is too late. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau joining virtually in a meeting that ran over five hours behind schedule. We're uh, close to uh, close to uh, uh, resolving it, but there's still more work to do, and uh, Canada will continue to be there with uh, financial contributions, humanitarian contributions. Trudeau also speaking with Prime Minister Henri, who's stuck in Puerto Rico after gangs took over Haiti's main airport, while the Prime Minister was in Kenya to finalize a UN security force that now has no safe way to get in or out. Kenya is a lead nation, but there are so many other countries that have pledged to contribute troops. Canada is not one of those countries, despite heavy pressure from the U.S. for years to send troops or police to quell the violence. It's like a, a patient that is on the table at the emergency and doctors are still dis discussing what they should do with the patient. You can say, well, at the end of the day, you have to do something. But what the answer is still isn't clear. Both Justin Trudeau and many Haitians say the solution needs to be developed internally. We're not asking you to send food, money. You know, the websites of the Canadian government always says we just sent X millions of dollars to Haiti. We're not asking for that. So far this year, the number is $123 million from the Canadian government to help with security, but that won't help get the nearly 3,000 Canadians trapped inside Haiti out, Donna, with Global Affairs ruling out evacuation flights. Mackenzie in Ottawa, thanks. A ship loaded with food intended for people in Gaza is still stuck at a port in Cyprus because of what's being described as technical difficulties. A charity leading the mission, the World Central Kitchen, says the vessel is carrying 180 metric tons of food, water and supplies. It's working with the United Arab Emirates and Cyprus to get the boat through a new maritime corridor to northern Gaza after clearing an Israeli security checkpoint. This is separate from U.S. plans to start building a floating dock off the coast of Gaza to help get aid deliveries in by sea. Fears of a famine are worsening by the day in Gaza. At the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, there's little to celebrate. Ceasefire talks have stalled, and Rafah in southern Gaza is still bracing for a ground invasion by Israel. Jackson Prosco reports. At this makeshift camp in Rafah, Ramadan is marked not with traditional daytime fasting, but instead with a desperate search for the next meal. If the first day of Ramadan is tough on us, how will the second and the third days be, this woman asks. There had been hope the Muslim holy month would usher in a ceasefire and the release of hostages held by Hamas. My strongest appeal today is to honor the spirit of Ramadan by silencing the guns. There is no deal in sight. The situation in Gaza is only growing more desperate by the day. Even as the pace of airdrops increases, Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry reports at least 25 people have now died of starvation. The death toll has surpassed 31,000. We can't let Hamas survive. Yet Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vows to press ahead with a military invasion of Rafah where hundreds of thousands are still sheltering. It's either Israel or Hamas. There is no middle way. I mean, we have to uh, have that victory. We can't have three quarters of a victory. We can't have uh, uh, two thirds of a victory. Those comments were a direct response to U.S. President Joe Biden. I want to see a ceasefire. Over the weekend, he suggested an invasion of Rafah would cross a red line. We cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. But Biden's words appear to be an empty threat. The president said he would not suspend military aid to Israel under any circumstances. Back in the camp, they can only wait for a break in the fighting that may never come. We don't want aid. What we want is a ceasefire. Jackson Prosko, Global News, Washington. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has made it clear what he thinks will happen with Ukraine should former President Donald Trump be elected president again. In an interview on Hungarian TV, Orban said Trump will not give a penny to Ukraine's fight against Russia and that if the Americans don't give money and weapons, the war is over.
On Friday, Orban met Trump privately at Mar-a-Lago in Florida. Trump has promised he'd end Russia's war on Ukraine within 24 hours if he wins the presidency. On his trip to the U.S., Orban did not meet President Joe Biden at the White House, a highly unusual move for a visiting head of state. On Saturday, Biden accused Donald Trump of sucking up to dictators and authoritarian thugs all around the world. A picture worth more than a thousand words. Coming up, the firestorm over the Royals' Photoshop fail. Plus, it was Oppenheimer's night at the Oscars. I cannot say often enough that it is by coming together that we create the best chances to improve our world and the lives of people everywhere. At his King Charles, he celebrated Commonwealth Day with a video message to Westminster Abbey, urging Commonwealth countries like Canada to find more ways to solve global issues together. The King didn't appear in person. He stepped away from attending public functions after his cancer diagnosis in early February. The Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, also stepped back from public duties after having abdominal surgery in January. The palace made it clear she was not seriously ill and is taking time to recuperate, but that has not stopped a flood of conspiracy theories. Kate herself released a family photo on British Mother's Day, hoping perhaps to put those conspiracy theories to rest. But then photo agencies quickly retracted it, saying it had been digitally altered. Redmond Shannon reports on how the royal rumor mill is spinning again. Prince William arrives at Westminster Abbey alone. His wife Catherine still recovering from abdominal surgery and likely from the publicity storm over that photo. The UK Mother's Day family portrait pulled from circulation by photo news agencies on Sunday over suspicions it was photoshopped. The Princess of Wales apologised on Monday for what she called her experiment with editing. My name is James Middleton. I'm a digital imaging specialist, that is a, a Photoshop specialist. And in case you're wondering... I'm certainly not um, Kate's brother, who is also called James Middleton. He says it doesn't appear the changes made were trying to fool anyone. So I think what's happened is three or four photographs have been taken in succession and they've been somehow spliced together. It looks like they've been using software to do that. In the age of AI and selfie filters, that would be no big deal. But this is a photo of a future queen who hasn't made a public appearance this year. The communication staff at Kensington Palace, the Keystone cops, they had to have known. I mean, mm. this would have crossed a line with the news agencies. Um, and it also threw gasoline on the bonfire of all the conspiracy theories. Many of those theories are, of course, absurd. But with this new twist, predictably, the internet had some light-hearted fun. From job openings to lunar landings and even Larry the Cat on Downing Street. The apology from the Princess of Wales is unlikely to quell those conspiracy theories online, at least until she appears in public again. That is not expected until next month at the earliest. Redmond Channel Global News, London. Still ahead, how to stay calm and survive if you fall through thin ice. In B.C. and Alberta, there were two dangerous avalanches with two different outcomes on Sunday. On Mount Seymour, north of Vancouver, a woman was rescued after she was buried upside down by an avalanche while snowshoeing. Rescuers say she was trapped for about 20 minutes until her companion, who dug himself out, was able to find her and dig her out. Rescue crews arrived to give them medical care. And in Alberta, a 19-year-old British Columbian has died after he and his friend were buried by an avalanche. They were backcountry skiing on Tower Peak in Kananaskis country, south of Canmore. His companion was able to dig himself out. Mountain Rescue later recovered the man's body on Monday. Travelers are being urged to check the Avalanche Canada website before heading to the backcountry for any sort of winter activity. Rescue crews are reporting an increase in the number of people falling through the ice this winter. It has been an unusually mild winter in parts of Canada, and activity on frozen lakes and rivers can be risky. With the help of experts, Jeff Semple shares a first-hand account of what it's like to fall through the ice and survive. 
This winter's mild and wild temperature swings have proved deadly on the water. We've had a lot of mild temperatures, so it becomes harder to predict the quality of the ice. This water rescuer says this is typically the most dangerous time of the year. And it's easy to see why. There's no safe ice. Ice at this point is all questionable. We join Dave Humphreys for a lesson on what to do if you fall through the ice. Trying to get your body as flat as you can, kicking your feet, and trying to pull yourself or sort of slither up onto the surface of the ice shelf. And then once you get there, we want to stay low. Once in the frigid water, the clock is ticking. But how long before hypothermia sets in? We came here to find out. This laboratory at Brock University studies the impact of temperatures on the human body, including extreme cold. They wire me up with sensors. This harness provides support in case my legs collapse from the cold. Then it's time to get my feet wet. Instantly, my system jolts. Definitely shivering, trembling, hard to control the breathing. And at this point, you can see my heart rate has shot up and my skin temperature is dropping. It's really that sudden drop in skin temperature that drives the cold shock response. Professor Stephen Chung, known to his students as Dr. Freeze, says those first frigid moments cause many to panic and drown. Many people have this mistaken belief that as soon as I fall into cold water, I'm going to die from hypothermia. But after a couple of minutes, my heart rate and breathing relax. I've stopped shivering. I can talk normally now. Um, and things have really calmed down. You will recover from that cold shock. That panic doesn't last forever. My core temperature remains normal. So too does my grip strength. You have about maybe 10 to 15 minutes where your muscles are still strong enough that you can kind of use them to self-rescue. Finally, after about 25 minutes, my core temperature drops. I'm shivering again and losing strength. I've decided I'm more of a hot tub guy. The key lesson, if you fall through the ice, catch your breath, take your time, and don't panic. Jeff Semple, Global News, St. Catharines, Ontario. In Manitoba, dozens of animal welfare organizations have declared an overpopulation crisis. 45 animal charities and shelters released a letter today saying despite repetitive pleas for help, animal welfare organizations are not receiving adequate government support. They point to a lack of resources, veterinary care and food insecurity across the province, particularly in remote communities. The overpopulation has led to multiple people being mauled by dogs in the last two months. Six isolated communities have responded with dog culls. Advocates are calling for funding for accessible spay and neuter programs and an action plan for addressing puppy mills and backyard breeding. Stealing the show next, Oppenheimer takes a victory lap at the Oscars. And the Oscar goes to the last repair shop. Canadian talent in the spotlight at this year's Academy Awards. Halifax-born Ben Proudfoot won Best Short Documentary for The Last Repair Shop, which he co-directed. It's about a Los Angeles workshop that repairs thousands of musical instruments for free, ensuring the city's public school students have playable instruments. Proudfoot told the Canadian press the win is a victory for arts and music education in Los Angeles and around the world. As expected, two of the box office hits, Oppenheimer and Barbie, got a lot of attention at the Oscars, but only one went home with an armful of awards. Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer about the creation of the atomic bomb. Though it was a Canadian actor nominated as Best Supporting Actor, who a lot of people think stole the show. Mike Armstrong on the drama of last night's Academy Awards. I have to go to the envelope for that. It was with a bit of awkwardness that the big night wrapped. Here it comes. Al Pacino dragging out the suspense. And Maria is the Oppenheimer. But in the end, the best picture went to the frontrunner. Almost from the day the star-studded cast was announced, Oppenheimer was pegged as a possible winner. Wow. It moved to probable winner when the first reviews rolled in. We're in a race against the Nazis. Director Chris Nolan says surprised him about the release was the movie's commercial success. Starting with the release of the film in July, the, the response from people around the world far exceeded anything that, that I'd imagined possible. 
Oppenheimer pulled in close to $8 billion at the box office. It finished in third place for the year. But ticket sales don't mean Oscars. Not one of the best picture winners of the last two decades ranked in the box office top 10. Killian Murphy. Well, Oppenheimer took home seven Oscars, including Best Director and Best Actor. We made a film about the, the man who created the atomic bomb and... For better or for worse, we're all living in Oppenheimer's world, so I would really like to dedicate this to the peacemakers everywhere. This is a film that is provocative and that asks questions and is challenging, but yet, you know, it, it, so many people want to see it, uh, so I'm really, really proud of that. Build a town, build it fast. One thing that likely helped with the Academy was a sense that Nolan was, as the Hollywood Reporter put it, very overdue for recognition. Thank you. He's had hits, but the stars only aligned on Oscar night for Oppenheimer. This was just this perfect conversion of critical consensus, popular acceptance, and sort of Oscar profile, because they like period biopics. The top movie at the box office walked away with only one win. Barbie took the Oscar for Best Original Song. Now, Oppenheimer and Barbie were actually released the same day last summer. Well, the line of the night at the Academy Awards came as two of the stars joked about putting their rivalry to rest. And the way this award season's turned out wasn't that much of a rivalry, so <laughs> just let it go! I'm just the standout performance of the night came from Canadian Ryan Gosling singing another song from Barbie. Going in, there was criticism of director Greta Gerwig being snubbed, but with Barbie closing in on one and a half billion dollars at the box office, there was still plenty to celebrate. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. That is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Air Canada is the Sheringham Point Lighthouse, a national heritage lighthouse on Vancouver Island. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.